Four players presented by Barstool Sports. Once again, our clap sync was way off, but that's just yeah. how we do it. That's how we roll. Uh, Frankie's got a little smirk. Trent's been struggling with technology, but we're back. It's uh, Monday morning for us, Tuesday morning for you guys. Uh, going through a little bit of a Masters hangover in the sense that I didn't really consume any of the RBC heritage this past weekend. I know Stuart Sink. I was trying to follow some storylines, but it's very difficult. We talk about this every year. Very difficult to go from watching the Masters, the back nine at Augusta, to just watching, you know, a regular PGA Tour event. Um, nevertheless, there's some good storylines, so we will get to that. We have Dean Norris on this show, if you're not familiar. He was uh, a big part of what I think almost all of us on the show consider maybe the best or one of the best shows of all time, Breaking Bad. Huge golf guy and a very funny dude. So we talk with him about golf. We talk about uh, the, the career, the industry in terms of acting, which is always fascinating to us. Um, so listen to that. That's coming up at the end of the show or the second half of the show. And then other than that, we have Frankie Borelli, our very own Frankie Borelli, posted a, um, an amazing score, a 76 <laughs> this past weekend, that when I saw that scorecard, uh, I mean, I was, I was amazed. That's just a really low number. It's a fantastically low number. And I was with my pal Trent, you know, it was one of those days where we had some time off from, uh, recording. And like you said, a little bit of a master's hangover and we had a bunch of merch that we wanted to show the people. So we said, why don't we go over to the links, the, the rock, as I like to call it, Rockville links. Um, it's become probably my home course around here. It's a nice little flat long Island, Nassau County, um, short 6,400 yard, but treacherous greens type of course, which I'm, I've become very fond of because it's just, that's my style of golf course, I guess I've grown up with it. Um, and it was really good to just, you know, just kind of kick it back. There was no cameras and just kind of play golf. And boy, was it nice to, to finally get some balls to go in that hole. I mean, Trent was there. He was, uh, he was witness. It was, it was, I became like a different person. I don't know what happened, but I was taking divots. I was draining like 50 foot putts. It was a lot of the times we were laughing, like what is happening? The putting was really the most surprising part. There were, I mean, you were a great ball contact all day. You took the, the divot that I was recording, maybe the best swing you've ever had. But the, the putts, you were just making them from 30, 40, 50 feet. And to the point where I, we just couldn't believe it. But yeah, it was a good vibes day. It was my first time at Rockville. Um, I loved it. That place is great. It was nice. And we had talked a little bit about this when we were playing, Frankie. We play very hard golf courses, this podcast in general. And we're spoiled. We go to these fantastic places like Pinehurst and, and all these different awesome golf courses that it was nice, I will say, to play a place that was flat, where it was yeah. you, you can see it. You just hit it, and then you hit it again. And if you hit it in the right spot and you hit it the, the way you're supposed to, it's going to land on the green. I did that very rarely when I played Rockville, but the idea was there. And I, I had a great time. I shot 104, not as good as Frankie's 76, but it was just a good day. And Frankie played fucking out of his mind. Yeah, there's something about stepping up to a tee and knowing you can take hybrid and like hit the right side of the fairway and you have 160 in, 175 in, and there's nothing, there's nothing that's going to come out and get you, right? I feel like a lot of the places we play, you can hit a great shot and not be rewarded for it. And that kind of sucks. And, and you get into this mode of like, all right, like there's really nothing I can do. I just suck at golf. Meanwhile, like a lot of the times it's just, we're playing really, really difficult golf courses. Now I'm not bitching and moaning about that, but it is like you're saying, it's nice once in a while to kind of play just a regular golf course and, and be able to like, I mean, the greens there are nasty and thank God we had Luke there, the superintendent who literally knows how to read the greens was just telling me, just put the ball here. Now does, did that help me get to a 76, a hundred percent. Um, well, I, yeah. so, I, so I was watching your Instagram story, obviously, and every time it panned to you and you were on the green, the ball just went into the hole. Every it was insane. Time. It was insane. The ball, every time. Now, I don't know if it's Rockville, but I want to tell you guys some more breaking news. I, I, I played again um, yesterday and I shot a 79. <laughs> I mean, I, fin I finished. Come on. I finished. So on the, the front nine, I shot a 30, uh, 38. And then I went, hold on, I got to look. I had maybe the craziest back nine of all time. It was just such a funny back nine. Front nine, 38. Then I went, I shot 41 on the back. I went double, bogey, 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 birdie, birdie, double. So it was just like <laughs> balls were falling in holes. Balls are going OB. They were falling down out of trees. But, man, that place, it, it is an easier golf course. There's no, there's no debating that. Like, I'm able to not 
I, I hit maybe two drivers the whole day. So when we play places like Torrey Pines and we play Beth Page Black, when I'm ripping driver all day into the wind and I'm finding myself in crazy bad situations. That 79 turns into a fucking 96 quick for me because I'm not so, good out of the shit. Like, I don't know how to recover. So let me ask you this. We talk a ton on this show. Matthew Fitzpatrick coined it with his buddy texting him like, I'm back. Do you believe now that this is the real Frankie Borelli or is this... And an anomaly and an outlier, or is this like, is this who you are on the golf course? Dude, now? the last two rounds I've played, I've broken 80 both times. It's insane, but I haven't missed a fucking green. I'm legitimately taking divots with these irons. I'm hitting nine irons, pitching wedges into greens, and I'm not missing. So I haven't had to chip. When I've had chances to chip, I've fallen apart. So when we do play these courses coming up, we're about to talk about how we're going to go play a lot of, a lot of golf and a lot of difficult golf. I don't know that I'm going to necessarily say I'm back. I'm playing a very easier golf course that that completely um, goes to my game. And, and it, it, it all the fairways turn my way. And it's just built for a lefty that doesn't know how to hit fucking wedges. And so I'm not going to I'm not going to officially say I'm back. I will say that I've, I have like a new swing that I needed these rounds. Yes, I dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bro, it's like everyone tells you to swing softly and like effortless swings. And I always think to do that. And everyone's seen my swing. It's so fucking fast and short. And that's when I get the hooks and the hosels and the fucking tops. Bro, I needed one round. And this was the one round with Trent to understand that if I swing unbelievably slow in my head, just like literally Hideki Matsuyama in your head, like just fucking barely get that club behind you and then barely get it through. If I do that, the ball will still go where I want it to go. And I needed that sense of confidence to see it happen. And now like that, I know that it goes where I want it to go. I'm no longer swinging fast. It's the craziest thing. I'm legitimately laughing after I make contact now. I do think the biggest thing people have ever told you is, is your tempo. It's just yes. tempo. They've talked about that through your chipping all the way through your full swing, because everybody loves your swing. You have the prettiest swing on the show by far, but your tempo, when your tempo is solid, you're just, you're just really solid. Like you just hit it really well. Yeah. It's a good feeling knowing like, I just, I want to play a more difficult golf course. Now I want to see how it goes. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the test and we're about to see you're the about test. About to get your wish, your wish, brother. You're about to get it real quick and re things are about to get real for you. You know, what's amazing about your 76. There's a lot of amazing things about it, but one of the amazing things about it is you still can't chip. You had right. blow ups on 14 and I think 15 where you, you had, you were forced to chip, and you still cannot do that. Like you, reason, I, it, I should have shot a 71. That's I, mean, I, legitimately, I legitimately kicked the ball around in the back of the nine. It was, it was insane. Dude, if you didn't have those two blow-ups on the back nine, yeah, you're shooting 71, 72, <laughs> like no insane. doubt about it. There's video, and it, it was up on the Insta story of you on 15, just on, at the bottom of a hill trying to get up, and it just wouldn't happen. For, what'd you make on 15? I think I made a seven. It was bad, but like if yeah. you if you eliminate that, and you had a, a great day otherwise anyway. But like if you eliminate that, now we're talking about really low numbers. Let yeah, it's it's just good to see the ball go in the hole once in a while, you know. If you look mm -hmm. at my fucking gin handicap, I have ninety eights in there. I've got eighty sixes. I've got ninety two, and then all of a sudden you throw a couple seventy numbers in there. It's just nice to see. I don't know. I, I'm very excited for this fucking year. It's only fucking April right now, and I'm just feeling good. So we have got, and we're going to get to it, we teased it a little bit, we've got uh, the whole crew next week. We're going out for with the USGA for U.S. Open uh, Media Day for both the women's U.S. Open at Olympic and then flying right down to Southern California. And the next day we're playing Torrey Pines. And we're going to see what we shoot. So we'll get to that. First, got to remind everybody that uh, Owens Mixers exists and the Barstool Transfusion exists and it's fantastic i was drinking of quite a few of them had a couple buddies in town this weekend um you know the beverage cart uh girls are saying that people are ordering them left and right and they're obsessed with them so every time they come back they're re-upping they're going double triple uh transfusion because they're that good so do yourself a favor go to owensmixers.com go to amazon go to your local retail whether it's kroger's whether it's Publix, and pick up some owens transfusions um, some Owens mixers. They got all kinds of different flavors. We talk about Lurchy's little Paloma kick that he's on um, with the grapefruit. You can get the um, mint cucumber and lime. They got all kinds of good stuff. So big thanks to Owens. They support a lot of what we do. So you can support us. You can support them by uh, by mixing it up. No pun intended with a little Ooh, Owens mixers. Dude, I had yeah. a Paloma yesterday. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, probably one of my first Palomas. I think I may have had a Paloma and just didn't know it was a Paloma. But man, that tequila, it is a, it is a tasty little drink, man. 
It is a tasty little fucking drink. It's a nice, um, it's a nice change. It's like a little change of pace from kind of your standard cocktail because it's different. It's very different than a lot of the other stuff. Whether you get a John Daly or whether you get a Transfusion, the Paloma hits a little different. So it's it does nice. hit a little different, and it's got a nice fruit in there, and you just feel like you're drinking a nice citrusy, just tasteful drink. You feel like you're on the mm-hmm. beach when you drink that. <sighs> yeah, it feels like yeah. a beach drink to me. It definitely has its. Um, it definitely has you know the warm breeze hitting your face kind of feel. Maybe sitting out on a boat kind of feel like uh, mm. you're, you're not really riding the boat. You guys are kind of docked somewhere, or you're kind of just moving back and forth. You're floating on like a lake it. boat, maybe. I yeah. appreciate the legitimate critical thought that you gave that because it would have been easy for you to just be like, yeah, sure. It's kind of feels like I'm on a beach, but instead you, you gave a like, oh man, let me really think about that. And you really you took yourself book. back to yesterday or whenever you were drinking that Paloma right. and thought, what am I feeling at that moment? What does it feel like? And it feels right. like you're floating on a, on a boat in the middle of the ocean. Yes. And I was playing good golf and I had a nice drink in my hand and it, you know, it, it was the, it was a good feeling. It was a good vibe drink. It's a very good vibe drink. And also something you can sip on, which I like. I'm excited. So, I'm excited to see your game at Olympic. And, and uh, those excited. are two. Those are two nasty, nasty little buggers. <laughs> Tory Pine. So I, you've played it. Uh, the rest of us have not. We were just there for a few hours one afternoon in January, kind of filming a few things. That golf course looks impossible. It looks like there's nowhere to hit it. It looks like it's just windy all the time, and it looks like it's going to be a serious problem. So I have very little confidence going into that. I. Golf course. I want to know if I can take my game that I currently have been playing the last week on a 6,400 yard course. And if I can just apply that to what are we going to play those fucking courses at? I mean, plus 7,000 plus, right? Yeah. I think we're going to try to do it as close to like a U.S. open setup as we can and just like, see what we shoot. What happens if I just take that game and bring it there? Like how many strokes do I lose? Right? Like if I just act like this, I'm just going to play it the way I want to, not the way the course wants me to. That's what I've been debating. Like, if I just step up to Olympic, I'm like, yeah, I'm taking fucking hybrid off this tee because I'm going to keep it down the middle. Then I'm going to take a fucking six iron. I'm going to hit a short. But then there comes the fucking wedges. Right. It's, it's just going to be a different game, man. It's going to be a different game. It is um, it is tough because it mentally gets in your head that you can't just hit hybrid like nine iron. So now you're like, I got to pipe a driver and then you have a shitty or a quick swing without the tempo. Now you're like, what the fuck happened? I was in the middle of fairway last weekend all week. Now I'm in this ridiculously thick rough. I'm 220 yards out. And then it just adds up. That's only one hole. Now you just do that right. over and over again. <laughs> Look at my fucking <laughs> I'm genuinely not looking forward to playing Torrey Pines. And I love Torrey Pines. I <laughs> I love Torrey Pines. I think it's a great venue. I think the U.S. Open is going to be treacherous. It's going to be what we like the U.S. Open to be. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be beautiful. But for me playing it, and I've talked to some locals at in San Diego being like, yeah, it's just like not that fun of a golf course to play. It really isn't. Like, I, It's just the truth. I mean, people probably say that about Beth Page also. You're out there in 120-degree weather. You got to walk the fucking thing. You're walking up these hills. You got the wind. You got the, six, the 15th hole. You just want to go home when you're on, on the other side of the road. It's just – that Torrey Pines is not that fun of a golf course. We Where, talked about that. What with did Seth you shoot Law the last also. time you played there? What did you shoot um, when you played there last? Fuck, you, you know, shot got, like ninety. Remember, you had to get up and down or something on eighteen. I feel like to break ninety, and you, you know, you kind of did. I think I around, made it. Yeah, I think I made an eight on on the on the eighteenth. But, but yeah, um, you didn't play too poorly. I didn't play too poorly. We got. I remember the the starter was like, "This is." The, uh, he goes, "Mark it down. The only day that there's going to be the wind like this forever, like forever." It was just no wind in the beginning in the front nine. So we will never have that again. Um, I remember on the back nine seeing people tee off on one and they're hitting their fucking drive and their hats are falling off. So that's <laughs> that's what we got going for us. That's just what we get too. Like when we were in Vegas, it was the windiest that they've it's ever been for four oh, yeah. days straight. I mean, we couldn't even talk. We were worried we had audio issues because it was so windy. We were like, we're when not we did the scramble it. against Paige and them, it's in Scottsdale, it was raining and 55 degrees. Boys, I've been here for about five months. It hasn't rained or been that cold once since then. That Incredible. is absolutely fucking bullshit. In the first day you guys got here, it was 45 degrees and just raining. And Scott's in the middle of the desert. It doesn't. It just doesn't do that. <laughs> it's not. That's not a real thing. Um, but yes, we are going to California next week. We're gonna we're gonna film stroke play and just see what we shoot. We're gonna have a little stroke play competition and just see what the numbers are. Trent, I know you're clearly mr break 100 guy um you shot 104 out at rockville links i'm i'm curious to see your game because 
I think people were probably highest coming into this year on your game and your improvement by far. Yeah, I uh, yeah I shot 104 at Rockville. All, all these reports about Torrey Pines is making me very nervous. If, if you know if it's going to be windy, if Frankie can't even break 90, I feel like I got a big number coming for me at Torrey Pines. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna I, I'm obviously going to try my hardest to break 100. Probably not going to happen at Torrey Pines or Olympic. Um, and I know there's the idea of me doing a breaking 100 video series is something we've all talked about. It's something that the the viewers on YouTube have suggested a lot. And now we we are doing that. We're we're going to do that. Me and Jake Bass are going down to Eatonton, Georgia, I believe it is, and I am going to train with one John Tillery, JT. You guys, the listeners might be familiar with him. He is Kevin Kisner's swing coach, and he has offered his services to me for reasons that I don't quite understand. And he is going to try to help me break 100. And we are going to document the entire thing. I'm going down there. Uh, it'll be in a couple weeks. It'll be early May. He's got a whole spot down there. He's got a bunch of bays. He's got all everything I need, everything I should need to help me on the path to break 100. And I'm going to train with him for a few days. And then I'm going to keep checking in on him. I'm going to try to break 100 at a few courses uh, over the course of the summer. And we're going to – hopefully it works out. Uh, are you, you're not, are you going to Olympic and, um, uh, Tory prior to these meetings? Yes. Okay. That's a problem. Yeah. But I, I'm very, very excited to see how he dissects your game, not your swing. Will he implement things into your game that make you break a hundred before completely changing your swing, right? Like there must be things that you do that get you out of holes. I mean, you are, you famously make eights and nines and shoot. A, I mean, at Rockville, you made like three sevens and shot 104. If you right. just eliminate like whatever stupidness you did on the other stupidity that you did on the other side of the hole while we weren't paying attention, you just shoot like a 96. Like there's no problem, 96. So I wonder how he's going to – like you guys are going to play around, right? You have He has to see the way you play golf is my point. And you I have a nice to, buttery swing. I talked to him on the phone about a week ago. And I, I asked him, how much of my swing have you seen? And he said, very little. So he is going to have to just watch me play and dissect it from there. In terms of, is he going to do things like a quick fix to help me break 100? And then we'll dive deeper into like restructuring my swing or, or making big changes? That I don't know. That, that's up to him. And I'm sure we'll talk about it when I get there. I would prefer, honestly, um, not to do quick fixes. I would like something that I'm going to just take with me the whole way. And then once I break 100, I break 100. I don't want to do band-aids, break 100, and then just tear the entire thing down. That's what well, I don't right. want to do. I was gonna. I think, I think your lack of ability to break 100 to most people when they watch videos is baffling because it doesn't sync up with how it appears you're playing the round. Like very frequently, it's like Trent's the all-star of this round. He's crushing it. And then they add it up. Trent, everyone's like, what Trent shoot? And it's like, oh, he shot 103 or 105. And it's like, how did that happen so even myself i go back and think i'm like how did trent get to that high of a number because you hit a lot of fairways you hit it pretty straight you're you're a really good putter especially for somebody who hasn't broken 100 so it doesn't compute so i think like to frankie's point i'm very curious what he's going to target because it feels like whether it's strategically mindset whatever that it wouldn't it's like it doesn't take a groundbreaking you know, change for you to start posting like 95. Like if you just went out and played tomorrow and you hit every fairway and you posted, oh yeah, Trent shot 94, I wouldn't be stunned. I'd be like, yeah, it sounds about right. I think there's a couple of things that I personally know about my game that I wish I could fix. I wish I could, my bunker play was better. Yeah. I, I, I die in a bunker. I die in a bunker. There's, yeah. I forget where we were in Vegas. I just died in another bunker. Like I think we were filming me for 15 minutes. Like I just couldn't get out. Where like it was it was a nightmare. My irons are still pretty inconsistent. Like the main tip for the last couple of years that I've been applying is the Kisner knuckle tip, and that has improved my iron play dramatically from where it was. But it's still super inconsistent, and I don't necessarily know where my irons are going. And what was the third one? I had one more. Oh, I I would really love to have more distance on my drives. My drives, I just I kiss them out there. And they go nowhere. They go like 230. And I think if I were able to, um, you know, straighten my drive out a little bit, I know it's a strong part of my game. I hit a lot of fairways. But you do lose something when you don't have much distance on your driver. So I would like to 
get a little bit longer there. But if I were to clean up some of those things, I think I'd break 100 pretty quickly. Yeah, chasing a little distance out there. You know, that's not that's not too uncommon. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm I'm entering the race with Bryson now. I have a <laughs> right. professional swing coach. I, I'm I'm in John Tillery's stable now with along with Kevin Kisner and and Ricky Fowler. So I'm just in there now and I'm chasing distance. <laughs> um, I think that this is one of the more anticipated series that we've ever done. I'm, uh, you know, because we look, we joke around. We like to make people laugh. Sometimes we we hover a little bit more around like the surface, and this is going to be digging deep beneath the surface, getting into like technical approaches, how to, how to improve your game, how to just get better, how to shave strokes off, which every person that plays golf, every person that's a fan of golf plays golf. Uh, we talk about that a lot, right? Like if you're a big football fan, you don't go out and play football on the weekends. You're not working on like your fucking out routes and stuff. Like you're, you're, if you're a golf fan, you're very into golf. You're reading Golf Digest, you're reading like instructional stuff, you're watching YouTube videos like we talk about with Nate Pregazzi, and now we're going to have our very own guy take that to the next level with a PGA Tour, you know, Ricky Fowler, Kevin Kisner, like some of these guys, uh, you, as many Ricky Shea shots as we take, like, you know, these guys are some of the top 50, 100 players in the world at the game of golf, and, this, and JT works with them, and now he's just going to be applying what he learned to our very own Trent Ryan. It's very exciting. I'm very excited, honestly. I think I'm hoping it'll be very instructional for me, which I'm sure it will be. I'm hoping it'll be instructional for the viewer. Hopefully they can, if their game is similar to mine. I have a lot of people reach out to me constantly in DMs being like, my game is just like yours. Like, I understand the pains of being super shitty at golf. Like, hopefully people who, those people can, will be able to watch these videos, take something away from it, improve their game. And I just honestly, like, I want to be better. I want to be so much better at golf. I'm, I'm honestly sick and tired of showing up to these events that we go to or when even when like Frankie and I play around or when we all play around and I'm just by far the worst golfer in the group. Like that's infuriating. I'm, I'd like to close that gap a little bit. And JT seems very into it. I'm very, very into it. Um, I'm excited to get down there and start working. And yeah, it's going to be great. We're going to, he said, we're going to split the days up with, we're going to train. And then he's also going to take me out and we're going to do some like, Eatonton, Georgia shenanigans at the lake or something. I don't know what all that is, but we're going to film the whole thing. We're going to put it out eventually, but uh, I'm very excited. I think it's going to be great. I think once it happens, it's floodgates. I think you become just a sick golfer. I think once you get over that hump, there's no coming back. Like you'll just be a very solid, go out there, have fun, shoot a decent score kind of golfer. There's no more extreme blowups. Like you'll, you'll never see the 122s and the 114s that we're accustomed to seeing when we play these hard golf courses, because you're just going to, like, I'm really excited to see how he applies like your buttery swing to just scoring better. Cause like, like you're in such a different situation than me with scoring. Like I genuinely can't hit a wedge. I just can't fucking do it. And I actually think I need to go see someone not like I need to see Jesus, like someone that's close to God, because right. at this point, <laughs> dude, I've still, I stood over on short ranges and like chipping areas. And I've been like, all right, dude, like, there's no one here anymore. There's no cameras. There's no funny business. There's no ha-has. There's no hee-hees. Let's just fucking chip this golf ball onto that green, right? We have 10 of them right here. A couple little pellets, a couple little bullets. Let's get those things on the fucking green. And I just can't do it, man. Today, uh, Yesterday, before the green, before uh, the round, I just fucking I just fucking put 20 balls down. I didn't get one on the green. I chunked 20 in a row. And I looked around. No one saw me. I was by myself. No one around me. And I just left. I'm like, this is a fucking joke. So I'll be very interested to see how he can take your score down. So everyone look forward to that um, series. It's going to be a great one. I can't wait. I want to get the music involved in that with like like intense, like dramatic, like will Trent do it? And like, like let's see how fu- let's see how he applies this amazing tip. Will he do it? next week on breaking 100 just like (laughs) let's fucking go trent people are gonna be on the edge of their seats we're we'll be bringing you in for the music on that videos no doubt about it you're you're our john williams (laughs) um well look playing good golf is um you could you could argue that that's a gift and we've got mother's day coming up and whether she prefers a statement piece or everyday subtle elegance blue nile.com has fine jewelry for every mom Mark Mother's Day with something enduring um, from textured gold to multicolored gemstones and classic pearls. You can shop this season's stunning trends on BlueNile.com. It's nice to get somebody a nice gift, huh, Frankie? 
Dude, I've got a little story, which is this is this is incredible. So you my raised dad, your hand, you were so excited. Yeah, yeah. dude, my <laughs> fucking dad, my dad is a one of a kind man. The guy makes his own rules in golf. He does all these things. He's unbelievable. And what he did the other day with my mom is something that I just only he could do. So this is why he should have went to Blue Nile because the guy is a mess. It's my mom's birthday. It's right before uh, Mother's Day. And he buys her new ear. He wants to buy her new earrings, right? So he goes, and he um, he finds these nice earrings. You know, it's been a tough year for everyone. He's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get nice earrings for her. It's like we're gonna do this. is nice. It's the new year. It's 2021. The whole thing. So he goes in there and he finds this deal where it's like these like three carat diamond earrings for only like 1999 it's like like not 1999 bucks right and he's like oh my god these are usually like seven grand eight grand this is amazing i found an incredible maybe even more 10 grand 15 grand he's like i found an unbelievable deal so he swipes the card the company the borelli's card he's like i'm i'm doing it whatever it is what it is i'm spending the money so he gives her these earrings she's like holy shit these things are unbelievable like they're huge they barely fit on her ears they barely fit on ears they're hanging off her earlobes she's like i can't even wear these things frank she's like what what did you buy me these are unbelievable so he's like all right we'll take them back and you'll like you'll see if we can refit you you'll see if you can refit you so they're like talking to the jeweler and she takes them and he goes you know what we're, we're gonna swap these for something a little bit smaller and she goes well you can't like you can't do that like that that's not a fair swap turns out he didn't buy $1,999 earrings. He bought $19,999 earrings by accident. And he's, he, and the lady goes, sir, I, I don't know what to tell you. You bought $20,000 earrings. He goes, he almost had a heart attack in the fucking, t- he almost, no way. he almost had a heart attack inside the fucking jewelry store. Now, if you worked with Blue Nile, this never would have been a problem. But you know the way they write the fucking things and the shady people at these jewelry stores? They didn't oh, tell yeah. this this 61-year-old man that's just, like, scrapping together some pennies to, like, try and do something really nice for his 60th birthday. He's like, $20,000. The lady's like, I can't get, I can't exchange these. I can't give you your money back. You made the mistake. And she, like, closed the door on him. He's sitting there being like, oh. I'm now homeless. Like, what? what is happening? What? What is hello? Hello. What's that? <laughs> she goes in the back and they have like a discussion. And I mean, thank God, somehow someone talks some sense into these people and they let them return them because she'd only worn them for like a day, but she ripped off the receipt. Can you believe the feeling on that fucking man with all that he's been through this year? To say, that almost I gave just me spent, a heart attack. Just I just spent twenty thousand dollars on earrings. He's like, he couldn't. And he's telling me the story. He's laughing so hard that he, like, he was nervously laughing. Right. Like, could you, can you believe it? Can you believe I did this? Like, that's just money that is unconceivable amount of money to be spending on earrings right now. And it's just, it happened on a day that he was trying to do something nice and it, it fucked him. And it's just, that's why you go to these websites that have everything nice and set, Blue Nile. You don't go to these shady fucking places that want to take your money and they write the fucking prices so small. Oh, and another little wrinkle was apparently they had that in the wrong section. So actually, he was kind of right. Like, he was kind of correct. But it is funny that my mom was like, what did you buy? These things are unbelievable. <laughs> Dude, they were like they were like six carat earrings. They were fucking like, oh, my God. Well, that would never happen. Like you said, this Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever without spending, you know, 20 grand. With jewelry <laughs> from BlueNile.com and our listeners, get $50 off your purchase of over $500. This podcast exclusive is only good for four play listeners, use the code four F O R E. That's code four. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. So go to BlueNile.com, use the code four. You get fifty dollars off a purchase over five hundred dollars. Shop stress free on BlueNile.com today. Um, Barstool Classic today. When this show comes out, uh, we're adding a stop, Lake Charles, Louisiana. We were supposed to go there last year. Uh, COVID was was spiking in the area, so we had to cancel it, and there was our little hurricane. So we're finally going back. We just decided we're adding that. It's June 10th, so people can go to BarstoolClassic.com, sign up. Uh, hopefully it's not sold out by the time you get this. But noon Eastern on Tuesday, that is going live, so you can sign up. Speaking of Barstool Classic, we were in Atlanta on Thursday, Friday, and I just wanted to say that we went to a Braves game. Um, first Whoa. like sporting event that I've been to, you know, since COVID and everything happened and Truist Park is awesome. And we were talking a lot about, you know, knocking off ballparks. I feel like is really, 
I mean, golf courses and, and ballpark. Like, if you go to NFL stadiums, nobody really cares. If you go to, like, ice, you know, hockey, NHL rinks, I don't think anybody really cares. Going to cool ballparks is great. And Truist, you know, was only about four or five years old. They got the battery built it up. Um, it was fantastic to just go to a game. I was saying we had, like, three beers before we even got to our seats because we were so excited. Just have a beer, have a hot dog, be at a game. Uh, it felt a little bit like we were we were back. I think they had, like, 33%. Um, capacity, uh, but and you know we've talked a lot about because we have musician, mu- musicians, musicians, musicians on the show. Almost yeah. said magicians, which is very different. But we would love to have magicians on the show if they want to come on. We've had them at the classic. That that yeah, fucking, oh true. Uh, that wizard. <laughs> What's that kid's name? Lucas Slyther- Slytherin. <laughs> <laughs> he freaked. Um, he free. I. It's funny. I was my phone just like pops up old pictures onto it sometimes. Like if I scroll too much, an old picture pops up. And I had one, speaking of Mr. Brelly, I of Frankie and Mr. Brelly just sitting at a table at Cherry Valley trying to figure out what Lucas was doing. They, they were just deep in thought. They just couldn't believe it. I, I yeah. just popped into my head. Frankie wanted to, like, burn him at the stake, I think. Uh, Dude, he, my dad made me walk away with him. And under he, like, as we're walking, he's talking under his breath. He goes, I just don't know how he's fucking doing it. I just <laughs> – he goes, I really want to figure that one out. Um. But it was just as a, on a general note, you know, we've said like we can't wait for shows to come back. We can't wait for concerts to come back so you can just be out. It just felt, fellas, like the most freeing, like being outside. The sun was setting as the game was. Ha- it was and you, nobody cared. Like, yeah, they were playing the Marlins and they got, ended up losing. Nobody cared. Like, everybody was just happy to be outside. Um, so it just felt good to be at a ballpark and to see a game. And Truist Park was really sweet. Yeah, man, ballparks are great. You know, they're just fucking great. The sound of the bat on the ball. Yeah. Just uh, the idea of guys jogging on the outfield grass and tossing the baseball. I I love nothing more. I used to love nothing more. Um, I believe when I was younger, it was Jorge and Jeter used to do it. But then as I got older, it was Robbie Cano and Derek Jeter on the on the foul line before the game they'd go out there and they'd just warm up real quick it would be like right before they went onto the field and the and 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 the view of how they would throw would be so fucking smooth and the ball would never go down it would never it would never decrease in its plane it would always hit the glove at a perfect line drive and i used to love the way that looked and it'd make that noise, and they were just, God, and Jeter would go all the way out to, like, the fucking short porch and toss it home. And just the best feeling being at a baseball park. It really is the best feeling. Dude, and, like, in Atlanta, I, I tweeted this out. Like, the people were just so nice. Like, we were with, you know, Ian and Nick, who who you guys know, who run the run the classics. So they go to a bunch of the stops with us. And we just, every person, like, you know, when you when you roll out and they're um, kind of the usher helps you, like, oh, yeah, your seats are like, every person was, like, asking us where we're from and like telling a story and it just was like it just felt good to have some positivity to be outside to be at the game people were nice and then my other big takeaway from atlanta was there's just master's gear everywhere and we you know like we're used to when you go to you know a course in the tri-state area especially because the pga was at beth page in 2019 there's like beth page gear everywhere you see everyone's rocking beth page pga championship type gear when we have the classics whether it's at cherry valley or just anywhere kind of in the in the tri-state area we see beth page gear all the time and i i just didn't like obviously the masters is in fucking augusta georgia but i didn't didn't really process it right away it was just everyone had masters gear wow. every single person was rocking masters gear which was cool because you don't it's hard to get you know like unless you go to the masters you can't get masters gear so you don't see it that often when you do it sticks out but it was very much in my head of like every person that rolled up to the tee at the classic a bunch of people that we saw at the ballpark just had masters gear and it's interesting how it's just different like i imagine there'll be a ton of you know like tory pines gear when we're out west because that's like the people's course of that area and like the main kind of venue and it's cool like regionally to just see who has what gear and how much that means to the area um, real quick, I, I was searching the internet because I'm on a little crew neck kick right now. I just think crew necks are cool, like finding throwback crew necks. I, I bought an Islander one that I'm, I can't wait to unveil. Um, it's not really throwback, but it's just a cool crew neck. And I was looking online, and I, I saw a crew neck Masters one, and now I can't find it again. But would that be something where it's like you weren't there when they sold that, and it's like old school, and it's almost buying someone's used one? 
Like, is that acceptable when it comes to Augusta and the Masters? If I rock that thing out to a bar, everyone's going to ask me, like, holy fuck, where'd you get that thing? It's like, well, I just bought it off eBay. That's not as I, fun. You know, we've talked about it a good amount on this show, like the the proper, you know, is it weird to wear stuff from places you haven't played or tournaments you weren't at? And we've, I think we've almost all fallen on like, yeah, I don't love like wearing something from or having something from a place I haven't been. I do think maybe Augusta is a very rare exception because it's so hard to get stuff. And like if your dad or your friend or somebody goes and like brings you back something that's like, oh, I know. I know somebody who went and it's a little different, but we've I do been think- there. Did, we- yeah, no, here's the, here's, here's yeah. my, I have two questions. I have one question. Do did the crew neck have the year on? I don't think so. It was just like, it was like, it was almost like that cream color and it was a green across. It said Augusta. It was fucking sick. I think going there one time allows you to wear anything from there at any time. And I would even go as far as to lie to someone about the crew neck. If they said, where did you get it? I would say I got it at the Augusta gift shop because I have been to a master's, which is true. I love it. I will try and find that. And if I can't, uh, if, you, if you're if you a listener and you have a cool crew neck from Augusta National, I would like to have that. I'm a medium or a large, trending towards a large. I didn't, this is making me think that I, or realize that I just did not buy enough master stuff when I went. Oh, I, not I, even close, like, dude. I bought that one. Not even close. I bought that one. It's awesome, but it's that blue, that really cool blue quarter zip. And it's just, my tits and my stomach pop out of it. I barely wear it anymore because it's just not the right it's not the right feel. I don't even know if it was Peter Millar at the time. Like I was just dumb. And right. it's just like, I don't even know what, it, you know, it's just not The good. only thing that I have that I see on a regular basis that I bought at the Masters is my coffee mug that I bought. And I see it and I'm like, that thing's fucking sweet. But I would love just way more Masters stuff. It's, Robbie it's Fox funny, bought like, a straw hat. Like that thing's sick. And yeah, that like quarter zip that, that Robbie Fox bought, that's he, four hundred that, that picture, he just looks like the Masters in that picture. He he just he, is the master, and he famously says, and it's true that that was the first golf course that he ever went to was Augusta National, which, <laughs> is, which infuriates a good portion of the golf community, but it makes me laugh every time. Yeah, he just had like a free Masters badge for the week and just walked around Augusta and was like, "Yeah, this place is pretty beautiful." That's just, just this tossing is cool. that badge around like, "Is this thing important? <laughs> like, do these things matter?" You know what? This this leads me to something else, and it doesn't necessarily have to matter with specifically the Masters, but. I need more golf pro shops to offer hoodies and crew necks. We yeah. were out we were out west for the Vegas Travel Series and every single pro shop that I went into, I went in there looking for some sort of sweatshirt, some short some sort of crew neck. Like, yeah, I'll buy a quarter zip, but I, I, we got a billion quarter zips now that I have in my closet. I want more hoodies and crew necks and golf courses just don't have those. I think it'd be a, an easy easy thing for them to sell that tons of people would buy. I think the hoodie is maybe the most in thing right now in the world. Like it's just at when Colin Morikawa, who's not even, you know, we, we always talk about how polished and mature and like he looked phenomenal in that hoodie that he rocked. I think it was like Friday. He just looked cool. They got such a good look. They're fun to play. They're, they're cozy to play in. They don't like restrict you and they're just in. I think a lot of courses that I've talked to, because you're right, when you go in there, it's like the merch team is pretty set in their ways. If you order like polos and quarter zips, that's right. just what that's what golf people wear. Um, but I have talked to a few of them. I think it was at Southern Pines when we were in North Carolina last week, and they were saying like, "Yeah, we do. We order the hoodies, and they they sell out in like a day. They can't even keep them in the shop because they're so in." So I think you're right. I think crew necks. I think casual wear is just yes. more in in golf, right? Dude, now. for an example, for I have a, when we went to Tobacco Road, I bought a Tobacco Road hoodie. I wear that thing all the fucking time, and it's just Tobacco Road's got such a sweet logo. And if more courses did that, I would buy a hoodie at every single course we go to because I just I love that Tobacco Road hoodie. And maybe it is that rigs that they have them that the courses we've been to and they just sell out. But just start ordering more casual wear hoodies, crew necks because that's the kind of stuff. At least that's the stuff that I want to wear. Every, you'll want to wear quarter zips and polos forever, but I'll also want to wear crew necks and hoodies forever. Yeah, like if you want to market your course, it, like people have golf outfits, right? You're, you're attending that golf course in a golf outfit. Give me an option to take something home 
and to like wear something to dinner that night where it's like, oh, I'm just going to grab a beer with buddies. Like, oh, like I'm not going to probably wear a quarter zip. I'm not going to wear a polo from that course. Like I want to take something back that I can show off your golf course, not on the golf course. Because if someone's already there, they've already done the deed. There's no promotion there. You're inside the pro shop. Like, right. let me let me wear something on the street of like whatever La Jolla and say, Oh yeah, I just was at Torrey Pines. Like, Oh, you guys just like, you know what I mean? It's, it's a lot more casual. It's that's it's, who you should be appealing to. It should be casual wear. You also, you get repped. You're right. Like if you buy a legitimately golf specific item, polo or a quarter zip, like you maybe get to rock it like once a month, maybe. And it's especially if it's at a, qu- the, right. especially if it's a, a core specific piece of merchandise. Like for us, the Barstool golf stuff, I wear that Barstool golf stuff to like Easter. I wear it to wherever you really can't rock. Like, I mean, I guess you can, but like the core specific ones are so like dedicated to playing golf where it's like a Beth page, black co- polo. I'm going to wear when I play golf. Like you, you need more yeah. casual. That's why I love what we're doing with Peter Millar, where like some stuff is just so minimalistic, where it's just like a really nice cut- color quarter zip, and you can wear that anywhere. You can wear that out to get drinks. You can do it. Like that's what these places have to do. When we go to these pro shops, I agree, Trent. It's a nightmare to find something that you really want to wear out. Like that's why you're in that pro shop. It's like, oh, I'm here on fucking vacation, and I could really use a shirt for like tonight or a fucking, you know, we're about to hang out around the hotel around a fire. What am I gonna wear there? And like, I'd be so sick to get this golf course on his fucking hoodie or a crew neck to sit there and drink a beer. Piners so does it. I've got a sweet Piners crew neck yes. that right now I'm unfortunately too fat to wear. I've I've gotten too large to wear it. But if I if I drop like 10 pounds, it's it's the might be the best crew neck that I own. It just says Piners across the front like a red and blue streaks and it's oh. like every time I wear it people are like that thing is sweet. Like I a Pinehurst quarter zip, a Pinehurst polo, those things are sweet too. But if you want something that you can just go out and have a few beers in, like that thing, that's it. There's almost nothing better. Nope. That's it. You're right. That is just it. I want to go real quick back to um, when we were talking about the feeling of being inside a ballpark. Barstool we can Chief, go back, Frankie. I'll go back with you. That's fine. Barstool Barstool Chief. Um, what the hell is that guy's real name? Ryan. Yeah. Ryan. Okay. I love Ryan. I think his I think his takes are great. I think him on Dog Walk with Eddie is great. Um, the Chicago crew is just an awesome crew. They're just fantastic. an incredibly likable crew. I was texting with Chief earlier today, actually. Him, he's uh, a guy I text when I find new like country artists that I like because he's oh. big into that, like Sturgill Simpson, Tyler Childers, Coulter that, Wall. Yeah, Coulter Wall. I, I just started listening to today uh, Zach Bryan. Who okay. I, he just popped up on my Spotify and I texted Chief and he actually texted me back. He was like, I'm listening to Luke Bryan right now. So, but that was, or Zach Bryan, I'm sorry. But yeah, he's, that whole crew is great. They're just fantastic. They get it. They're old school bar stool. They, they just like to argue, they like to debate and they, they stick by their word, which I love. One of the things that Ryan, Barstool Chief said, um, he actually tweeted out like, what is the best feeling and what is similar to walking out of the tunnel and seeing the green grass of a baseball field? Right. It's not like a moment. I saw a lot of responses to his tweet where it was like, oh, I walk off home run. That's not what he's asking. He's asking, like, what is even on the same playing field as walking through that tunnel and seeing the green grass of a baseball field? Because everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. That yep. feeling. Very few. There's very few things that are in there. I like, you know, we're, I'm trying to relate it to golf and I would but it's not it's not the same because when you arrive at a golf course you can kind of see everything from like the parking lot or you have a pretty good idea maybe a very rare case of a reveal where you like walk through the pro the pro shop or the clubhouse and then you go on like a back patio and you're like whoa but that's not that's rare that it would have that kind of setup usually you don't get usually it happens over several minutes and it's not the same thing as walking out of a tunnel so I can't even think of one right now so mine was you're inside a hockey arena and it's a massive game, most likely playoffs, and the lights go out prior to the game starting. The idea and the and the act of the lights going out is such a feeling that you can put yourself right back in that stadium. I don't know about you, Trent, but I know Riggs can, where you're yeah. like, holy fuck. It's like a holy fuck feeling of the lights are out, something's about to play on the scoreboard, and it's like the lights are going to start going around. That feeling of seeing those lights go out, to me, brings you back to that moment i can feel it i can taste it i can smell it it's crazy that's the only one that's similar i would say you're right because the lights going out means like it's go time we've been we've been fucking around a little bit we're throwing popcorn guys are flipping pucks around in warm-ups that's cute and when the lights go out it's like all right motherfuckers focus it's go time 
And yeah. that's, yeah. So you do, you almost get like the chills. I would say, like we used to say in college all the time, the best pump up song in the world is the national anthem. So yeah. I kind of start thinking, and I, I that, that brought me back being at the game, being at Truist Park. That was the first time in so long. Cause even I've been to, like we were at the US Open, we were at a few sporting events, but there weren't really fans there. When they like played the national anthem and everybody's standing there, and that again kind of like work, like it kind of um, calibrates everybody to think like, oh, it's about time to do the thing now. Like it's yeah. go time. Uh, so the national anthem for me kind of brings me back where you can hear it, you can smell it, you can like sense that it's happening and it's about time. Uh, but I do think the lights going out in, a, in an ice rink is a really good comparison. Yeah. I don't know anything else that's even similar. I mean, football, maybe seeing the green grass also, like if you're a huge football fan. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, tweet it at us if we missed any. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't thinking, been to like. But like before Iowa games at Kinnick Stadium, they do the the team comes out to back in black. But I don't know if that's if that's similar to what you're saying. Like it's that's like a thing that happens. It's not. I don't know. I guess that's similar. That would be mine. Yeah. That's like they just they just sprint out to that song. That's. That's the only thing that I can think of. But you are right, or or Chief is right, or whoever said it, that like when you get to a baseball stadium and you walk out that first time and you just see it, like that's almost unmatched. Dude, my first time I ever went to Fenway, and I'm a huge Yankees fan, and obviously hate the fucking Red Sox, but Fenway, I got a huge respect for. My first time I ever went to Fenway, I wanted to legitimately gather myself before I made the walk up the tunnel to see like the green monster and everything that I'd always wanted to see in there. You see the movies, you see the fucking everything. You see, it's such a movie scene of walking up that hallway. And I remember legitimately like stopping my crew that I was with being like, all right, like we're just willy nilly walking into this. Like, let's all just relax for a second in this hallway for a second. And I remember everyone was like, all right, like that's true. And we kind of took a deep breath and we walked up the fucking hallway and we saw, we walked right behind home plate and saw all of Fenway Park with the Green Monster and they were having batting practice. And it was such a cool, such a cool moment that I hate that it's a Red Sox thing, but how can you not, how can you not fall in love with just the idea of baseball and the Green Monster and all that stuff? So fuck, man, that is, I, I don't even know if the, the lights going out is even comparable. To no, me feeling. and me and my brother and our buddies, we used to go to Wrigley every year and we'd sit in the bleachers and just drink all day. That was like the most fun ever. But yeah, you walk, the first time you walk out, and you're on the bleachers and you just see all of Wrigley Field, like there's no feeling that can match that. I, I really Dude, us so. going to Augusta and seeing the whole course from that like pavilion, seeing one and you can yeah. see just out there was a oh fuck moment, but also it's Augusta National. It's so like, yeah, obviously have to be there to experience that. You can get that feeling of walking out to a baseball field anywhere. Um, yeah, I would say Augusta is is – just like it's one of a kind, whereas you're yeah. right, you can get any game. But that, like, you know, the story that Trent and I always tell is, like, we were there that first day together and walking down and seeing the 12th hole in a main corner for the first time. Like, we didn't say a word to each other for who knows how long. We just stood there and we're like, oh, that's it. Like, that we're just looking at it and we're, we're just part of what's happening right now. Like, we're out here at Augusta National and looking around was unlike anything else. But that's, you know, maybe – like when you do go to a really iconic golf course and you see, I think it's really cool when you see holes that you've seen before, but never in person and being mm -hmm. able to sort of like place where you are and understand that, oh, that's, you know, like when I saw the 18th green at Torrey Pines for the first time where like Tiger made that putt, I remember seeing it in real life and being like almost like speechless, like, oh my God, that we're there. That's the thing. Or seeing the Island green when we like played sawgrass for the first time, like you come down 16 and you're like, oh my God, they're like, it's actually in real life that exists and I'm seeing it. So I think maybe that's kind of similar. Yeah. 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 That is very similar. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a moment that you can just like, you can literally feel it as you talk about it. And that's the yeah. tunnel coming out there. Uh, to a baseball stadium it's the feeling of the lights going out it's walking through augusta yeah it's i'm sure there's a couple that we may be missing and hopefully someone will be screaming at us in dms or whatever it's like how did you not mention this but i mean i can't think of one off the top of my head so I yeah it was a good discussion by chief it is a good one that's really good that's a hard thing to replicate i was trying to think about holidays like whether it's thanksgiving or like christmas more if you can if i could come up with something that that puts me in that place but i don't know if there's any one specific clear moment right like we don't 
I was trying to think if we, like somebody rings a dinner bell for Thanksgiving or something, but we don't do anything like that. It's kind of just like happens. Thanksgiving happens yeah. in the course of the day. Speaking of feelings and holidays, I felt like like Christmas hasn't felt like Christmas in a while. I don't know if that's just because I'm getting older, but you know that feeling of just Christmas being like, all right. Like the last couple of years, I've legitimately said to like family, I'm like I'm going to enjoy Christmas this year. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to like watch the movies. I'm going to listen to the music. And then it just kind of like comes and goes. The, 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 the Northeast like snowstorm in December 2nd and it lasts until like it's not there anymore. It's fucking 65 degrees. And it's like you're like, what I is think happening? weather. I honestly think weather is a huge part of it. Like I know it's a little bit like, oh, yeah, we used to walk uphill both ways to school kind of thing. But I feel like it was always colder and like snowy for the most part when I was a kid. And that just brought you into Christmas. I think it's age. I think it's purely straightforward age. I, I mean, I'm with you because I, nobody loved Christmas more than me as a kid. Like when you're five to, to 11 years old, Christmas time is legitimately magic. There's yeah. legitimately magic in the air because you probably still believe in Santa Claus. Like you just get excited and, and everyone else gets excited, the music, the movies. And then you get older and you realize that it's it's just it's another a lie. day. <laughs> it's, it's a lie. It's not like, only is it a lie, but it's very much just another day. And I'm with you. Like I try, I make a point every year. I'm gonna start listening to Christmas music, you know, right after Thanksgiving or whenever you find it appropriate. I'm gonna watch all the movies. And even even that like dies out eventually. And it's just like it's just another day. And it sucks, but it because Christmas is the one holiday where you do feel like you can put yourself back in those places when you were a kid. And then you get older and you watch the kids go through it and you're like, Oh, I'm just an adult now, man. I'm getting fucking depressed right now. Like there's just no, there's no way Christmas will ever be the same. It's just, dude. Remember I, I when search we went... for it, man. You try, you really reach for it and I've done it too, but you just never get the same feeling. Do remember we went to Australia and we were there, you know, in December and there we just, Realized that their Christmas is in the middle of summer. Oh, that was brutal. That, that was at, sucked. That was they at, had like I mean, they're selling snowman decorations and stuff, and we were like, "What are you guys doing?" Like it's the middle. I mean, of people summer in Florida then, like legitimately just like they 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 put fucking uh, lights on their palm trees. Arizona does the same thing. I was gonna say that started. I started thinking about that because I'm looking outside and I'm like, I'm in the middle of the desert. Like I can't have Christmas here. I gotta leave every year. I also Bro. think a part of it with the weather is revisionist history because yeah. I, th I think if you went back and you were like, how many days, how many Christmases when I was a kid had snow on the ground during them? And I bet it'd be way fewer than you remember. Like now you just, you're so conscious of everything that you very much know when it's Christmas and there's no snow on the ground. But as a kid, you just, you grab all the good ones and you cover, you say that they were all like that when I doubt that they were. I think I think we can make a better effort, though. I, I really do. I think us individually can have a better effort. And this is a buzz, bizarre conversation to be having on April 19th. The fact that like we're about to go into summer. It gives us time. It gives us time. Yeah. Let us all make a pact to ourselves and to each other that this year we will strive to enjoy the Christmas time, right? Regardless okay. of what you believe in, it's still the it's still the season. It's the season season's greetings, the seasons of giving, everything. In that moment, let's just soak it in, right? Because I remember, I don't know if it was this year or last year. Definitely not this year because this year sucked. But I really got into Halloween. I went to a couple Halloween parties. I got a couple, uh, I got. A, I watched a bunch of Halloween movies. I was getting all spooky. Um, like, it was like, it was definitely 2019. But yeah, I remember being like, that was Halloween. How, man. how spooky were you getting? What do you, it was getting what do you spooky, mean? man. You know, because it was just getting fucking spooky. Like, I remember... I bought like a fog machine for my friend's house and like everyone that walked in, they walked through the fog and the lights were off. And that was Halloween. I remember after, I remember in November, I was like, that was fucking Halloween, man. Yeah. Like, so we fucking when should did we, Halloween. When, when can we start though gearing up for Christmas? Like right December after December 1st. Okay. All right. December 1st, you, maybe we'll all buy one of those advent calendars where you get 25 boxes of chocolate, yeah. you know, okay. the little doors. Um, my friends send them to me. Sometimes they're boobs. You ever see those? Where oh, you yeah. Open it yeah. Up and it's like, it's just like different types of booby shake at you. Those are fun. But let's do something like that. Maybe we'll make our own little advent calendar for golf. And every time you open up a door, it's another one of our stupid faces. Or Yes. Thing. Look, <laughs> I, well, I'm in on this pack. Four play, the 4Play podcast is going to bring it for Christmas 2021. Yes. 
Yes. All right. I like it. I'm we into are, that. We are going to fucking bring it. And if we don't remember to do that, this is on you now, the listener, to and the watcher on YouTube, which our YouTube page is exploding, by the way. We just got verified. You guys need to hold us accountable, right? If you don't see things starting to pick up around December 1, December 2, I want this clip sent back to me being like, where the fuck are your, where's your Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, like, little nose? And where are your antlers? And where's your jolly green smile? I don't know why Dude, I said green. I'm telling you, I'm going to have, by December 1st, okay, I'm going to have a Christmas tree. I'm yes. going to have that fucking thing all decorated. I might get... I might get crazy and get those antlers for my car. You yeah. know, those like reindeer <laughs> yeah, antlers yes. for my car. Yes. Let's just do it. Let's be huge Christmas guys this year. Go out to dinners and drink eggnog and like mm -hmm. wear sweater vests and like little fucking turtlenecks and go out and maybe you go to a church one night and like just see people singing and let's just like do real Christmas stuff. Let's go see the tree. Hopefully they have the tree back in New York city, go ice skating outside, drink some hot cocoa, like really get into it early so that when Christmas comes, it's like, wow, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted from how much Christmas we just did. man. <laughs> Damn. Now, we do got to be a little bit careful because I think like you, we don't, we're not trying to be the political crew that's like trying to bring Christmas back. We're no, we're just about the fun and the and the festivities of yeah. Christmas. We're not. I don't want people to think they tuned into something a little different here. But we are. <laughs> we're gonna bring it for Christmas. I'm. Yes. I couldn't be more in on that. I think that's a good. That's also just a good brand to have that we're huge Christmas guys. Huge. Uh, and like you said, it's not religious. Christmas is beyond. It's just a fun. It's yes. just a. Uh, it's a feeling. Like a, Yes. Right. It's magic. I mean, it's just magic in the air. Man, I got to tell you, it's not going to be that hard for me because I just love Christmas. And having an excuse to just blow it out for Christmas, I'm very into that idea. 100%. You know who's going to be the most excited person about this development is my mom. My mom loves Christmas. Hell she yeah. listens to this show. I know she's out there right now. And she's like, I bet she's running downstairs into the storage room now. Like, I, boy, have I got some surprises for you guys for your new Christmas. Yeah, she's going to be fired up. So, uh, so I'm in. Um, Another thing that everybody should be fired up about, by the way, and be all in on is the Barstool Golf Time app. I'm seeing a lot of people. We had um, we had tens of thousands of people downloaded the app. Uh, it's great. It is, you know, we, all of us on this show, we grew up, none of us were country club guys. We weren't members anywhere. We got into golf by just going, finding public courses with, you know, the best rate, with the best reviews, whatever you could possibly find. It used to be, you just had to go on different websites or you just have to call the shop all the time and be like, Hey, like, how's your course? Can we come out and play it? Well, we have curated the Barstool golf time app for booking tee times. And we are focused on getting reviews up there on, you know, uh, making it so that when you click on a course, people can upload photos, videos, you know, they rate the course and they go through and, you know, tell you, what that golf course experience is like, and it's going to be like-minded folks like you who like golf. You know what they're looking for. We're going to be in there all the time. We're uploading as much as we can. There's going to be a reward system that we're rolling out very soon. So the more tee times that you book using the Barstool Golf Time app, you're going to get discounts. You're going to get free rounds. You're going to get merchandise, very exclusive merchandise. So go don't download the Barstool Golf Time app. We have our own tee time app, fellas. It's, un it's an unbelievable app. You know, we can use the U word as much as we can because it's an ad mm -hmm. advertisement for our own app. I mean, it's something that you should just have. And we're saying that we're going to have all these rewards and these benefits for downloading it. And I think getting in there early will benefit you to, re to receive those rewards. You don't want to be late to the game. You want to get your reviews in. You want to get your tee times booked. We will reward the people that do the most on the app. We do the same thing with the One Byte app where we actually take what people – that have done i'm sorry let me just restart that over we you start that sentence to do that sentence over here when people have done a lot of mm, when people actually do a lot of things and see i'm not using good enough words here that's where i'm struggling when you, you just do stop piecing it together you're no your i'm just i'm really struggling here i'm here, really yeah. really struggling here when you do a lot within that app we will mm, you know, it's just something that we're going to notice, you know, like we're going to see that when on the one bite app, when you have a ton of reviews, Dave and I will look at that and be like, oh, this guy's got 55 reviews. This guy knows what the fuck he's talking about. Let's see what this guy said. That's something that we take into account more than Joe Schmo, who just downloaded the app, doesn't have any uh, act activity going on. There we go. Take it away, fellas. I'm done. You got there. You, you did great. You did, yeah. Really Barstool Golf Time there. app.
Go download it. Go use it. Go book your tee times with it. Um, Stuart Sink. So Stuart Sink, 47 years old, started the tournament with back-to-back 63s and had a million-shot lead, held on. He's got his son on the bag, which is really cool. Um, anytime Stuart Sink does anything, though, you know, I, I obviously am bald, completely shaven now. So I saw Trent tweets out the picture of Stuart Sink, the famous picture with the hat, tan line, and then I just get tagged over and over again um, because I, I've had the Stuart Sink. And it's tough when you got the full shave. It's like when you're on the golf course – you know, you don't want to get your head burned like crazy, but if you don't have the hat on, then you just get a hat basically like tattooed onto your head because, uh-huh. you know, you get the tan outline. Um, but Stuart Sink always brings up that picture. Seems like a, a super nice guy. And it gives everybody hope. When you're 47 and you go out there and win, I think it's his second win this this wraparound, you know, season. Uh, it gives everybody hope that you're 47. We talk about distance. Bryson's hitting a mile. The game's going to pass everybody by. Well, Stuart Sink just went out and pretty much lapped the field. Yeah, I tweeted that picture out, and I was stunned by how many people thought it was from yesterday or from Sunday. Everyone was thinking, oh, yeah. like, yeah, they like they thought that that was a new picture. That's one of the most iconic pictures in, in golf history. I'd put it up there with just about any other picture because it's so preposterous. Riggs, what's your sink level right now? Are you pretty even um, or are you? No, pretty even because I go, I think. That's pretty you good. Know, I, yeah, that's I usually try to. Somebody told me that you need to go, like, um. Try to go a third of the round at least without a hat on, and that then it'll tan relatively evenly. So I do, I do, I think I'm doing pretty good right now. But it's also easier because I live in the desert where it's just sunny every day. So anytime if I have a bad run, I can pretty much just go outside the next day for an hour or so yeah. and get a little get a little color going on this thing. Yeah, that looks pretty even. Uh, the back to back 63s from Sync were stunning, and stunning to the point where you realize that nobody else in the tournament reached 16 under all week. Like if he had just Taking those two 63s and then played and went par, par, even par the next two rounds, he still wins the golf tournament. Like, that's how stunning those two 63s were. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a great fucking story with his with his son, too. Right. Like he hadn't won in a while. I think it was a it was a pretty decent gap. Right. With him not winning. And then all of a sudden he has a son on the bag. Did I see 11 years? I want to say it was, I think, 2009 was maybe the, the last time. Well, it's when he won the Open, right, in 2009. So, I mean. Yeah, with that, with that horrific green outfit going on when he took down uh, Tom Watson. Everybody was rooting for Tom Watson. <laughs> Everyone was rooting That's against right. him. That was, those were tough times for Stewart. Yeah. He, um, uh, he told a story on this show, actually, yeah. about when he knew everybody was rooting for Tom Watson. And he went and basically hid in the porter potty to make sure that he was second on the tee because he knew that if he arrived first on the tee that nobody would give a shit and they would all just go crazy for Tom Watson when he came up to the tee second. And he wanted Tom Watson to realize that he had fans too. So he literally hid, allowed Tom Watson to go to the tee first, and then he came second so that Tom Watson could hear the crowd give him an applause, which was amazing. (laughs) It is funny. Tom Watson actually tweeted at him yesterday and he goes, congratulations to Stuart Sink on winning the RBC Heritage. You played some great golf in one of my favorite tournaments on one of my favorite golf courses. Enjoy your victory, which I saw some people were like, I like that's kind of like passive aggressive where it's like you just I can't get away from you. That's my favorite course, favorite tournament. You want it like I just fucking hate you. Tom Watson's (laughs) just like I hate. Stuart sinks so much. I hate his son. I mean, these are all just, this is me just making jokes, but I like to think that that's what he's saying. Yeah. I saw a lot of people were taking that. Like, is Tom, is Tom Watson throwing serious shade at, at Stuart sink right now? Um, but yeah, it's, it's nice again to see somebody older. He's got the cool story with the son going on. And then um, the other kind of news for professional game is Lydia Ko, uh won again. She's, you know, a lot of people are making the comparison comparison to Jordan Spieth, who, you know, they were at the top of the game major champs. Um, Lydia Ko has been doing the thing forever. She turned professional in 2013, and she's only 23 years old right now. Bro, oh. I watched that final round on Saturday night. They did a Saturday night final round in Hawaii. I was debating between watching that or spending $50 on that Triller nonsense, the the Jake Paul-Ben Askren fight. I, I didn't end up paying for it because I just – had a feeling it was going to be a shit show, which it was. Some people liked it, whatever. But I ended up watching Lydia Ko and Nelly Korda battle down the stretch. Lydia Ko, this is not a surprise to anyone, but she's just a robot. Like, when she yeah. gets it going, Nelly Korda, she just couldn't get her putter going. And it was pretty even for the first nine holes, maybe eight holes. And then Lydia Ko just, like, found a different gear and birdied, I want to say, five of the next six holes, and no one was going to catch her. She 
Yeah, and she did mention Jordan Spieth and uh, Hideki Matsuyama in her post in her post round presser, being like, "I saw those guys, you know, win after not winning for a long time." But just I hadn't really sat down and watched a lot of her rounds, and watching that, it was one of the more impressive things I've seen. Yeah, and she's got you know like she's been through a bunch of different caddies, like swing coaches, equipment, like so you know there was a lot going in parallels to the speed thing of like there's a little bit of you know is, is she lost it is it is it mental what's going on and for her to bounce back almost won um you know a major championship a few weeks ago and then comes out and wins but her stats again for being 23 years old i mean she was rookie of the year uh in 2014 she has 16 lpga wins she's got 13 major top tens, two major victories. It was 1,054 days in between wins, and she's only 23. So think about going, like, having all of those numbers and having that long of a time period between wins and only being 23 years. Like, she's not even, there's a lot of people, like, on, on the PGA Tour that we see that don't even make it to professional golf until they're older than 23. Like, look at Zalatoris. What is he, like, 26 or something like that? 24. And it's, 24 and he's just coming out and everyone's like oh this guy's appearing on the scene she's been doing it for fucking eight years and she's 23 it's amazing and she was number one in the world when she was 17 i want to say like preposterous this is one stood out to me uh lydia ko's last 100 holes one eagle 39 birdies 59 pars one bogey that's preposterous jesus that's so different than our scorecards man that's just fun watching her it was really fun I had that Saturday night final round in Hawaii. Like, I really enjoyed sitting down and watching that. She is, she's insane. Can we talk about, real quickly, um, Siwoo Kim and his putt? I mean, just as dumb of a rule, as, and we've gone through this a million times with the fucking PGA Tour and golf in general, but this fucking guy's ball sat on that edge and was slowly rolling into that hole you got Mac. You got Kucher saying, "I'm watching the ball." I mean, did you guys see this back and forth between the rules official Kucher yeah. and Siwoo Kim? It is so funny the fact that they have to argue with this guy, and he's like, "You just don't understand the rule." It's like, no, you just don't understand the fucking rule, man. This ball was oh, <clears throat> this ball was slowly rolling into that, and never, and never came to a full stop. Everyone that was actually on the green watching this ball with their own two eyes. Have, have admitted it, they've stood by it, and they said that that ball was constantly rolling towards the pin. Why does there need to be a shot clock on that thing? It, it happens like once in a blue moon. One, once every million putts will something like that happen. Why is that taken for an, an extra stroke? Why do you have to take a penalty there? It was just another really, really bad look for golf. Like, it's just not – we've said common sense rulings. Just make common sense rulings. Anyone on earth that saw that was like, oh, yeah, the ball just rolled, and it took a while, and then it, like, rolled into the hole – and then you're going to add a penalty stroke because it's 10 seconds. If it just didn't stop rolling and everyone that's there said it didn't stop rolling and continued to move, and then clearly it did because it went into the hole. That is and my the, thing, Rick. Like, like, how, how can you not say A and B? Like, A, I hit the ball, and B, it went into the fucking cup. What? How could you assess me a stroke in between there? There is no in between. I did not take it. A, nothing happened. I struck the golf ball. It rolled. It did not stop. Technically, it did not stop. And you know how we know it didn't stop until it went to the hole? Because it went to the hole. That is how it, nothing else happened. It just continuously rolled until it went into the hole. That's just what happened. Right. There's nothing abstract about this scenario. He... He struck the golf ball and then it went into the hole. That was those are just the things that happened. So I how I I can't even wrap my brain around making a different ruling because those are there's not like um oh did it did it oscillate when somebody was doing something in the weeds? Let's get a super slow mo. No, guess what? It's finite. He just he struck it and then it went into this little hole in the ground, which is what he's trying to do. And when it goes into the hole in the ground, that's just deemed the holes over and that's his score. And then they just added a stroke out of the clouds. That was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen. What's the difference between that and like a 200 foot green that has a, a, a slope that comes all the way down and the ball slowly trickles down towards the hole just because like us on the camera angle just couldn't see it like constantly moving there for the whatever it was 30 seconds minute like i just don't understand why the t- the amount of time goes against siwoo kim because the ball wasn't rolling from a, a longer distance it was slowly so, moving let me ask you this if tiger's chip shot on the 16th hole at augusta national in 2005 
if remember that ball hangs on the lip, if that ball just hangs on the lip for 11 seconds instead of like the two seconds or whatever it was, you're telling me they would just assess a penalty to Tiger Woods? How it, is that even? It a does move? break my brain a little bit when you watch the video clip back and it's just sitting on the edge. Like, how is that ball still moving? I get that people are saying that it, it was still moving, but isn't doesn't it get to a point where like it couldn't have been moving, moving? Like, I understand that the ball eventually goes in, but like, doesn't there have to be at some point during where it's sitting on the edge that it has stopped moving? I think that it probably could. I think at some point, if you want to like break it down to seconds, I'm with, I want to make it clear. I'm with you guys. I, but if you watch that clip back, there's no way that during that whole time that it's moving, moving. See, I agree. But I think within like each 10 second interval, maybe a dimple here and there, like slowly turned over and they're like, oh, wait, look at this thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think it really took its time and they saw a little bit of movement every couple seconds. And they're like, this thing's going to go in the hole. Like, I know it. You could see Kuchar's like that thing's still moving. Yeah. So I think if you're going to take the logic that like, all right, it rested for 10 seconds, like, all right, maybe it rested for five or seven or 10 seconds, but then it slowly inched inch towards the fucking hole again. Why are we not accounting that as like, all right, now, now start the clock. Now start the clock. Right. Now start the clock. Every time a dimple shifted just a little bit, everyone on that green knew that ball was going in. So I don't care what the fucking time is i don't care how long it stayed on that on that ledge see will kim and mac and kuchar do not are not going to lie about that they're they're looking at that thing right. knowing it was going to go in so like i trust them over that fucking rules official right yeah so it was baffling i i mean and i even know I mean, we've all heard the 10 second thing and like mentioned it or said but i didn't even know that it was going to be like yeah. that hard line or that that was even technically the rule like that could have just been to me it was almost like the five second rule that people say when you when you drop something on the ground like i was like is that a real thing and then the assessment penalty one of the craziest things i've ever seen didn't it happen another, to jt a couple of years ago it was hanging on the lip for i want to say like eight seconds and it dropped and it didn't cost him a stroke i forget pga when he won the pga yeah actually. that's Remember? what it was that's what yeah that's he, what i thought it was but it didn't cross the 10 second mark he, he got it in under the time or whatever Gotcha. Yeah, it is weird. It's just really the whole thing was just weird, um, and it's just a bad look for golf. So uh, one thing that's that's a good look for golf is Peter Millar, gentlemen. Really, really good thing in general. We already talked about Peter Millar earlier because, you know, we released a new spring line that's got um, hoodies, really, really cool kind of the camo, you know, print pullovers. And uh, I've got, I mean, I've got one of these shirts right here. This shirt is just really incredible. good incredibly sexy and feels really good um their polos peter millar's performance polos offer sharp style technical performance that makes it a staple for any wardrobe we're going to remind you guys that you can visit petermillar.com slash four you receive free shipping and a complimentary gift with your purchase but they've got all kinds of good stuff uh from their pullovers they got the hoodies coming out now their eb66 five pocket pants are the best pants in the world i've got just one of their t-shirts on right now because everything that they put their hands on is incredibly comfortable um but we love peter millar and we always have yeah they've got a lot of good stuff you get what you pay for i've constantly gone back and forth with people in dms and and twitter messages they're like it's so expensive blah 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 there's a reason why they're priced the way they're priced. And when you get one of the pieces of their product, you'll understand why. Like, that's the same reason why there's premium sports cars versus just your average mom and pop take them to fucking soccer practice type of cars. Like, this is the premium athletic sports brand in golf. That's what this is what you're going to wear when you want to look good. You want to feel good in golf. It's just the way it is. It's the way the world works. And to your point about those messages, all a hundred percent of the messages that we get from po folks that DM us and say, "I finally pulled the trigger. You guys finally talked me into yep. it. I got this pullover, and boy, is it worth it! Thank you. It's the most comfortable thing I own. Never once has somebody been like, "Hey, I paid X amount. I got this. I can't believe you talked me." Not once. Every time they're like, "I'm going back to the well. I'm going back to slash 4 I'm getting more gear because it's the best stuff." Never, I'm more confident in, in knowing that if you purchase something from Peter Millar, you will never, ever be not, not satisfied by the quality of the product. I'm more confident in that than anything in my life. If I'm going to push you to a product and I'm going to say you're going to, you you may not like the color, you may not, whatever you, you're going to complain about, you're not going to complain about the quality. You're going to be like, holy shit, 
this is the best quality quarter zip polo pants I've ever gotten. Because it is. It's that crazy how good it is. It's that crazy. When we get this shit shipped to us and we buy all, all, all our favorite color quarter zips, I can't believe how good they are when I open the packages. I cannot believe it. It's also just so exciting. Like when a Peter, when something comes from Peter Moir, it's so exciting to pull it out and to see what it is because the guy, I mean, it's just, it's just one of the, it's like, it's similar to getting new golf equipment. Like you get a new club. It's like you get so excited and it's that way when the Peter Moir gear comes. So go to PeterMoir.com slash four. Um, you're going to get complimentary shipping. You're going to get yourself a nice complimentary gift as well. Um, next up, we've got Dean Norris again, loves golf. Um, iconic figure if you've been you know and binged and watched one of the uh one of the great shows of all time we actually talk about how you know binging was kind of invented with breaking bad um that was kind of the time when people started binging shows so it's a really good chat with dean norris how you doing guys great we're doing great how you doing i'm doing good man getting sick of the zoom shit though you know i couldn't (laughs) agree more i'm so over the zoom shit yeah uh, but you know, it is. I guess it's good we have something to get back to work, right? That's right. That is right. How are you doing? I so uh, we're. I mean, we're obviously pumped to have you. I'm Riggs. We got Frankie and Trent, and um, you know, we understand you're a big golf guy, so we're excited to chat. Oh, sweet man! I'm playing. In fact, I'm playing as soon as we're done with this with this chat. Oh, we won't keep you too long then. You have a tea time that you're you're going to be late to, or what? Uh, no. Um, uh, no, no, it, it was scheduled a little later in the day. Anyway, oh, you can't get on a course these days, man. The quarantine, like everyone's playing golf now. Yeah. I don't know Everybody's if that's true. Playing. Are you guys on the East coast? Where you at? Yeah. Um, New York for most of well, Trent and I are New York Riggs is relocated to Arizona. So he got away from oh. the madness and he's been able to play, um, in Scottsdale, yeah. but, but yeah, New York's been crazy. Um, you know, we talk to a lot of these clubs around here and they're saying like, you know, even private clubs are like uh, play has doubled. Right. Because like yeah. it's the only thing people are able to do. So the courses are getting beat up more than usual. And right. There's just no slots to, you know, back last year, two years ago, you're able to go out there and there's no one around at, at, in times like this. So, um, yeah, it's a good thing for the game, though, oddly, the, the, the pandemic. Yeah, I think so. I think that a lot of golf courses are going to be saved, you know, yeah, uh, because that certainly has happened around here um it's funny because they shut down for like a couple of weeks and it's like why would you shut down golf when it's outside you're clearly socially distanced you know and uh, so me and my couple my golf buddies we would walk a couple courses <laughs> that were shut down uh and that was our you know that was our our, our entertainment during the severe part of the quarantine yeah Where are you based uh... i'm out in, Cal- I'm in southern california but i'm outside of la a little place called temecula um, that's, uh, we have a lot of good golf courses, right? It's about an hour and a half outside of LA. Actually, Ricky Fowler, uh, went to, uh, high school here. Oh, interesting. You know, Ricky at all? I don't know him, but I used to see him when I first, uh, started, I just started golf. Actually, I moved back here about 20 years ago. And at some point he was, uh, he would be a middle school kid playing at, uh, the golf range that I kind of practiced at. And he was a phenom, you know. And people would just watch him hit balls. Uh, and then, of course, he has a couple of course records around here for in high school. You know, he shot a 62 Jesus. on this one course that we play a lot. A 62 in high school. I was like, mm, all right. Man, we got one of our uh, one of our favorite guests, Doug Gim, who uh, almost won the U.S. Amateur. He finished low uh, am at the Masters, and now he's kind of making his waves on the tour. But he played like high school golf in Chicago and you know, he's just infinitely better than everybody else. And his stories yeah. from high school golf are laugh out loud. Funny. Yeah. Just like, like as in, just like his team would finish dead last, like 28 strokes behind the second to last team. And he would win the whole tournament individual by like 15. <laughs> shots. So, so, right. They were just awful. <laughs> yeah. It, it's amazing, man. It's a, it's a, it's such a great game, man. That, and, and uh, it, it, it's amazing that you can play at all these different levels. Like I have so much fun. I'm not that great, but uh, you can compete, you know, I mean, we play for money, not a lot of money, but you know, that 20 bucks, you know, it's like, you really want to win it, you know, and you're competing with guys. It's like, a, it's a, it's just a great sport that you can play at different levels, you know, and with the handicap system, you can, you know, it's everyone's kind of playing on a, on a even footing, at least for that day, you know? 
How long yeah. have you been playing? Do you pick it up earlier or just within the last couple of years or how long you been playing? Yeah, I wish I played it longer. I wish I played it as a kid. When I was a kid, it wasn't cool to play golf. I've been playing about uh, a little over 15 years now. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I still, and I'm still figuring it out. You always yeah, figure oh, it out, right? I don't think that Absolutely. ever ends. Nobody I mean, ever figures ends. it out. You watch the right. pros after they, they get done with the tournament, they go straight to the range. So it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And they got, they got coaches, right? The whole time. So, you know. Oh, yeah. That always um, stuns me, right? When like the best players in the world have coaches. Like I've always said that. Like Michael Jordan yeah. had a coach. Like it's yeah. just, I, and it always, at, at the end of the day, like you're going to tell me the best of all time, listen to someone else tell him how to play the sport. But I guess they need it, right? Like you need like a reset in your brain. You need another set of eyes. Like I guess yeah. it does make sense. But man, like Tiger like Woods going through coaches to me is just so crazy. You need right. that other set of eyes because like the feel versus real thing that we were talking yeah. about last week, where it's just like you think you're doing one thing and then somebody looks at it and is like, no, dude, you're actually up here when you think you're there. And if you uh, don't have that, it's it's infuriating. That is so, that is so right. You know, I have a buddy of mine who's always he semi coaches me, but I'll, I'll be like, I'm, I'm totally lined up straight. I'm, I'm fucking lined up straight. And he's like, step back. You know, oh, I'm a like, shit, man. I'm lined up to the right. Not, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> like, like, I can't, you know, I, I would have swore I was dead on, you know? Yeah. And uh, he puts the little little stick down, and I'm I'm off like a foot, you know. It's incredible, my, dude. My big one is like ball position, you know. I'll be like, uh, I'll think my driver's way forward in my stance where it's supposed to be, and like, right. you know, we're playing with kids, and he's chirping. He's like, "Why is your driver off your back foot?" And I'm like, "What are you talking <laughs> about?" You look at the footage, and you're like, "Oh shit, it is off my back foot." Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So Does, anyway. does that apply to um, acting as well? You know, we're all big fans of you. And, and you know, you have Thanks. these characters in which we've fallen in love with. And you, you know how to play the character better than anyone else. And then someone may come in and tell you, oh, you did something different this time or wrong. It, 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 does the coaching aspect come into play for you? Uh, if they do that, I generally punch them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's a uh, well. That's the director's. Uh, that's the director's position in the in the acting. You know, to um, and I think what they do is more. They mainly like dial it in, like put a little this on it, or put a little less on this, or we need a little more of this, or a little less of this kind of thing. It's it's more like that, uh, dialing in what they want for that scene. You know how they want that scene to be presented. What they need you to do in order to get there. So that's kind of the director's. Uh, that's their. That's their position, really, in in, in acting. So, um, so folks know. I mean, we. This is sometimes we just start talking with people. We got Dean Norris on. Um, we're <laughs> gonna put all that in because we're just talking golf. We're talking life. We're talking whatever the hell we want to talk about. But has this been recorded? Have we been recording? <laughs> oh yeah, this is just we just record. Um, <laughs> he, of course, he, he's a part of what I would say a huge part. Um, obviously, DEA agent Hank Schrader in what I would say is the best show ever created, Breaking Bad. Um, and, you know, you had a ton of different roles. I was going back through your filmography. Like, you've been doing the damn thing in terms of your listing since, like, 85. So you have been around. You've been in a lot of different stuff. You've been in Terminator. You've been in Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Um, and and I, I was curious, like, you sort of you sort of get the role of like a badass. Have you always kind of had the the role or felt like you had the role of just kind of a badass dude? I, I kind of definitely early on, I think. I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, but yeah, I've got a lot of those those roles over time. I mean, after you know, after uh, Breaking Bad, which believe it or not, is like I've done. It's, I'm three shows in now after Breaking Bad. No. Uh, I made a conscious effort to try to go uh, comedy, you know, which was the, which actually wasn't a, su a suggestion from Brian Cranston as well. I said, you know, the best thing you can do is just something completely different than what you just did, you know. So um, tried to move in that direction just because it's fun and because it's uh, it's a different, completely different animal, you know. So maybe early on I did. I don't know why, uh, but now I'm trying to. Uh, oh, maybe I can play a, a badass in comedy. That'd be fun too. <laughs> yeah, because Brian well, Cranston, that's a great example, right? He went from Malcolm yeah. in the Middle to then being Walter White. Like you cannot have two more different roles than that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just, and I'm, I'm not sure what the reasoning is, other than just challenging yourself and saying, you know, fuck it, might as well uh, do something completely different and see how you do, you know. Yeah. So. 
with Breaking Bad, was there a moment that sticks out to you where you knew it was something different, where you knew it was gonna it was gonna be this thing that was gonna live on forever? Well, there was the moment where we uh, where we read. Everyone had this experience reading the pilot, going, "Son of a well, man, that's the best thing we've ever read," you know. And then there's the moment where you go, "I wonder if we can get that on film." And there's the moment. Then there's the moment where we saw it and we said, "God, that's the best thing we, we've ever seen." But no one will ever watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there was that early moment of going, "This is really brilliant stuff." And I think it was close to season three. Uh, where we started to get people, particularly in the business and kind of early adopters, if you will, really started saying, man, this show is special. This show is special. But still no one saw it. You know, they were, they were like, we we're like, we're on AMC. What? Where? Where's that? 364. I don't know what the fuck it is. <laughs> <Where's> that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> seriously, man. And, uh, and so it was after season three, right into season four, where it really, and because that's when Netflix picked it up too. Yeah. And Netflix picked it up and far more people saw it on Netflix than ever saw it live on AMC. And it started rolling. And then, you know, we made our final deals in the final end of the show before it really took off. Uh, they had already knew they were going to do only, you know, the final season, final two seasons. And between the fifth season and the sixth season, it just, it you know, it was like the Rolling Stones for about six months. You know, it was like really happening. So I'm not sure at what point we knew it would live on the way it, it, it did and has, but somewhere in that Netflix area, we started thinking, all right, you know, this is, you know, they, I think they actually coined the binge watching on, uh, I believe that's true for, for Breaking Bad. It was the first show that they really, uh, people binged watched. Yeah. And at that point we started to realize, oh, it's going to live like a good novel on the shelf and people will be able to watch it. Young kids will be able to watch it, uh, you know, uh, as they grow older and blah, 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 blah. And it kind of took on its own life as uh, a lot of good, you know, any good show now does it, it lives on, you know, instead of just being on the air for, for that Sunday. It's, it's crazy, man, hearing you describe, because that was my exact experience. Like that was <laughs> like, binge watching breaking bad was like the first thing I ever binge watched and and yeah. that's like you're right whenever i hear that term the first thing i think of is those days when i would just shut the blinds sit yeah. in my fucking bed and just watch yeah. episode after episode of breaking bad yeah yeah and i think they you know i think they learned i mean i don't want to say because i'm not i'm not the head of netflix but i believe that they learned from that and said uh oh we need to create great content ourselves so that we're not beholden to other people to have to buy that content. And that's, I believe, when they really cranked in and started doing a whole bunch of their own own stuff and developing basically their own library, you know, because they realized that, oh, because that was a new thing, you know, people would sit down and watch, you know, 10, hey, five, two, three, four, 10 episodes in a row. And they needed they needed the content that would uh, that would justify that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, it is so. like it's interesting to hear you talk to about your guys experience like reading the pilot and understanding that it's awesome once you or get into it, but that like selling it to other people, because even when people ask, you know, about recommending a show and you say like, Oh, breaking bad, like, Oh, what's it about? And you give them kind of the elevator pitch. It doesn't yeah. sound like that sexy. <laughs> that, you're like, no, like, trust me, you got to get into it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, funny. it's just so true about it. I, I think there's a, there's a great story uh, that Vince tell, you know, Vince tried to sell Vince Gilligan who wrote this show. Uh, tried to sell this for two years and it was turned down by literally every single, every single HBO, uh, all of them, two years. He was depressed and they finally, I think his agent finally got him into a, a pitch on, with these guys at, uh, at Sony. And as the story goes, they did the pitch and they, and the guy said, you know what? That's the single worst idea I've ever heard for a TV show. But you guys are so into it. You're so passionate. We're gonna we're gonna do it. <laughs> Man, that's yeah. so nuts. That's like, that's just so crazy to comprehend because of how, yeah. how big it is. It's iconic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. it's amazing the starts of these iconic shows. Like we talked to Brian Baumgartner and. And like no one wanted to pick up the office because it was a reboot of the of the the UK version. It's just right. like and now you look back at Breaking Bad and The Office, and these are two two shows that will live on for 
forever until yeah. obviously the, the the sun explodes and then we're all not going to be right. here anymore but i'm not going to get right, into that but right, that's but right. well yeah. yeah sorry about that well, but well, that's not gonna yeah that's not gonna happen anytime soon though right no, you guys no, you guys got no. some insight i need to hear well, well Frankie no, we got, thinks he does and his kind of his brain's uh, a little uh, well you know, we sometimes think about bad. the universe on here what do you think what do you right. think about the universe what, you ever I think, think about it i think it? it's there i think i do i think way too much about it man i believe it's there that's for sure what, for sure uh, like we're just floating around out here yeah we are and there's <laughs> And, you know, I was just talking to, man, my wife just mentioned this. They did something, I think it was with the Hubble telescope, right? Yeah. And they kind of focused into a little little thing and, and really magnified it. And it was just pure light so that there were stars in this little spot for, as in, you know, infinite in that. So then you take that across the hole mm. and that's how many stars and things are out there in the universe, right? It's so, horrifying, dude. It is horrifying. horrifying. So yeah, then the question is, that was going to be my next question. Does that horrify you like it horrifies Frankie? Or does that bring you comfort just being like a very small piece of a much larger picture? Uh, no, man, it horrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. I think Hell it sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's the, <laughs> it's the reason I play golf, man, to forget about the fucking universe, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it dude. It's such a good way to realize how meaningless you are. You're just like, you're the most meaningless thing ever. Uh, yeah. And you think like, ah, oh, this is what's happening today. Oh, I'm going to do all this shit today. It's like, no, oh, man, that's so how much fucking stars are out there. They, they could give two shits about any of us. We were floating on a rock through an ever, never ending galaxy. And we're yeah. sitting on a golf course thinking about how we didn't we weren't able to chip over a, a bunker and we just duffed it into the bunker and now we got to hit our fifth shot it's like you know uh, it, it's the, it's like you're saying it's the complete opposite of what's actually happening in reality yeah. and that's why golf is so good most guys have tried different ways to last longer which is the goal i mean that's you know sex is cool people enjoy sex when you get to that point where you are having sex which again is cool and fun you don't want it to be over really quickly do you gentlemen absolutely no, not it's a marathon, right? You well, you would like it to be a marathon if you can. Yes, that's the goal. You don't want to be a sprinter. You don't, you don't want it want to be a hundred meter dash, forty yard dash. What's the difference? What's what's shorter? Uh oh, forty meters would be about one hundred and twenty feet, I think. Right? It's uh, like three feet per meter per yard. Okay, right around there. Wait, wait. What is shorter, a forty yard dash or a hundred meter dash? Trend. I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. I have no idea. Riggs? What, what is what is shorter? Sh what is a shorter amount of distance? 40 yard dash or a hundred meter dash? <laughs> 40 yard dash is shorter. Okay. How confident are we in that? I think a meter and a yard are very similar. Okay. I think they're very similar. So a hundred meters would be significantly longer. I think like almost three, you know, two, basically, two a, a basically a hundred, like a, like 150 yards or something. I think it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure that's what it boils down to. Anyway, it's, you don't, you don't want this thing to be a 20, you, you don't want this thing to be a, a 40 yard dash. All right. We're not trying to break combine records here when it comes to sexual performance and sexual um, uh, time spent doing the sexual activity. <laughs> Okay. That sounds like no, a guy who's not. had a ton of sex. <laughs> yeah, that guy. That's a cool guy right there. You know? Uh, <laughs> Rico Suave. Uh, sex time. Sex, sex. You don't want the sexy time. To, <laughs> you don't want the sexy time to, to be quick. Listen, you just want, you want to just, you want to thrust those hips. You know, you want to squeeze, squeeze those bags of sand as oh, long boy. as possible. I mean, I just watched a 40 year old version. Very, very funny movie. It just movie. holds up. It just yeah. holds up as long as possible. Uh, Roman know? swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast acting. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging. Each swipes packet small enough to hide in your wallet. They're super easy to use. You take the swipes out of the packet, swipe them on, let it dry, and you are good to go. You go to getroman.com slash four. You can get your first month of swipes for just five bucks when you choose a monthly plan that is getroman.com slash four. And I was going to ask you this about, you know, when you're, when you're on set and stuff, um, were you able to play while you're working? Because golf is such a good ex escape, right? Like when, whenever you're in something, you're able to go out and, and do this whole other thing. 
Yeah, I'm played a lot. I mean, because you, you know, you have you work long days, but then you also have days off, you know. And uh, we also had a, we had a Breaking Bad golf tournament that we Ooh. had, uh, kind of a charity thing. Uh, Sam Jackson played in it. Uh, you know, would have anybody who was in, in Albuquerque filming, plus our our group, and uh, we had that for a few years toward the end. So yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's uh, and a lot of actors play golf because of that fact that they have that kind of a schedule. So uh, if you're on location somewhere, you generally can find a, a fellow actor to play golf with, you know. Is there anyone in, in the Breaking Bad cast or, or you know, on the crew that's a sneaky, like, really good golfer? Aside from yourself, obviously. <laughs> uh, no, there were a couple of Teamsters who could play pretty well. Okay. Uh, and Jonathan Banks is, you know, curmudgeon. He plays golf like he is. He's a cum- old, slow curmudgeon. I like to <laughs> kick his ass. I really, every time he plays, he takes forever, you know, and he does it on purpose, you know, and I'm like, come on, hurry up, old man, just the fuck. And he does, you know, like, I'll take my time. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better than taking Jonathan Banks' money. Oh, I can man. tell. I can how's tell. The, uh, do you say like the- taking it to the bank or something? Do you do a little <laughs> line there? Yeah. Uh, no, but I'm going to next time. Nice. <laughs> how's the uh, golf in the Albuquerque area? So we do a travel series where we go to different parts of the country just to, you know, highlight some of the golf in places that people might not know about. And we kicked around the idea of going to New Mexico. Didn't end up working out. But how's the golf in that area? It's great, man. There's uh there's a uh, we there's about about I mean there's more, but we played a circuit of about five to seven courses. There's a lot of uh, uh, uh there's Sandia. There's uh, there's a bunch of good courses. Um, yeah, you, you wouldn't run out of golf in in, in Albuquerque. Yeah, that yeah. is a spot we wanted to hit. We were looking at, but we were we were actually blown away. We were looking in like early March, and we didn't realize that it's just like cold that time of year. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize that either until I started working there, man. They get we we had to shut down production sometime because it got you know below freezing type stuff. So Jesus, yeah, you just wouldn't yeah. think that from from that area. Um, so right. talk about talk about what you're working on now. You know, give us give us a pitch. Yeah. Give us what's going on. What's the update? It's uh, called United States of Al. It's a uh, sitcom from Chuck Lorre, who has uh, who's made a few sitcoms in his day. Uh, if you don't know, he's done like Big Bang Theory and uh, mm-hmm. Two and a Half Men and Mom and uh, Young Sheldon and on and on. Uh, and it's about this uh, this um, Marine who's my son who comes home from Afghanistan and he's all he's got some PTSD. He's got he's got some issues, but he's trying to bring he brings his interpreter from Afghanistan over and uh, he lives with us. And my daughter, who also has some some issues. And the thing is, and I didn't know this before doing the show, there's this whole issue with getting these interpreters from Afghanistan to come over because once they've helped the U.S., they're not their targets uh, where they live. Wow. So, uh, yeah, and I didn't had no idea and and knew nothing of that until literally seeing the show. So there's this whole special uh, visa um, program that we're hoping they really kick in because there's a bunch of guys that, that, that need to come come to the u.s and our show is about one of them who makes it uh and uh, it's kind of a you know in kind of recent chuck lorry uh, um i guess what he's doing now it's really it, it, it doesn't sound like a comedy but he takes a lot of hardcore problems of grief and ptsd and and my daughter has lost her fiance in the war so there's a lot of grief going on in this household and we try to uh, navigate through it and hopefully make people laugh along the way. Wow. That's really interesting. Cause you got to think, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people in the country dealing with those exact problems and, and the fact that you guys are able to kind of touch with them mm-hmm. and they're able to watch that and, and probably get a laugh out of it and, and, and see probably the better side of it and how you guys work through all those situations. That's, that's, I'm, that's a pretty damn good pitch for that show, man. Cause that you've got me, you've got me uh, intrigued now. Yeah, it's cool, man. And the guys that work with the, the people are great, and and the writing's fantastic. And and uh, you know, it's it's amazing that you know sitcoms can really bring light to certain problems. I mean, and and particularly cultural things, and and on and on. Uh, you know, if you if you look back, like with Will and Grace, and certain you know certain kind of cultural things um, can be brought to people's attention if you're not smacking them down with a drama or a documentary or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So hopefully that 
in the comedy format, uh, we can we can shed a little light on on some of these issues. So yeah, no, it is a great. It's like a it's an amazing platform to do it right because it's, yeah, I mean, there's so many people out there like Frankie was saying who like we owe everything to and it's it's hard to try to help everyone so if you can do something like that and kind of highlight what's going on but also realize that there's some humor in it and that you know like not take everything overly serious i imagine that's going to help a lot of people yeah we sure hope so and 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 hopefully people laugh and uh and uh, we'll have fun doing it so i know we have, the people the guys involved are great and the writers are, are fantastic and there's a lot of uh, uh military advisors and also five afghan uh, writers who are also on it so we try to uh keep the perspective and uh and get the get the right uh, the right perspective on the issue so unreal that's awesome that's yeah. do you find it do you find it difficult like when you were originally you know we talked earlier about how you wanted to kind of try something completely different from the typecast of the character that you've been playing a little bit was it difficult to like convince people that they should give you a shot because they look at you as like oh no he's not a comedy guy he's more of a serious guy yeah, well, yeah, it was a little bit. Uh, luckily, Chuck Lorre, Chuck Lorre, for, he was a big fan of, of Breaking Bad, uh, and hired me to play a very a, a kind of a similar character on The Big Bang. I just did like five or six episodes, but I played like a general uh, or something like. Yeah, there was like a general, and uh, and it worked, and and you know, and and it, it turned out to be funny enough. And then from there, he called and said, "Hey, I got this role in this." Uh, in this new project and, and you'd, you'd be perfect for it. So, um, but yeah, you know, funny enough, <clears throat> when I first started in the business a few decades ago, uh, I, I auditioned for sitcoms left and right and couldn't get, couldn't get a single one. And I would have died to do a sitcom back in the day. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but uh, I mean, I'd go into the room and like, <laughs> and it'd be like, <laughs> oh man. Yeah. And you're like, no, really? Oh, but God. And then you know, like, uh, I'm like, fuck, I'm never doing that again. It was the worst, but I would do it again because you, you know, I, I needed, I needed the business, I needed the job, and I never got a sitcom. And now oh. I'm on a Chuck Lorre sitcom on CBS. It's like, you know, it's amazing That's, how it works. It like is, that like... motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Send that Dude, to the people that didn't laugh. Uh, yeah. In, in the, yeah. The ten, Who's whatever. laughing now, motherfucker? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Dude, it's so interesting to us because everybody watches shows or movies, right? Everybody. It's like a huge yeah. part of everybody's life. But seeing, like, hearing about the process is so fascinating to me because we just turn on a show and you're just there and you're just yeah. your character. And that's all we see. So I think, like, Entourage opened a lot of people's eyes to a little bit of the behind the scenes and just kind of, like, understanding how the industry works so so hearing about it and hearing what goes into it like i can't even imagine walking into an audition and just like okay like make me laugh clown it's like oh geez like that gives me the heebie-jeebies yeah i'm telling you man that's the worst comedy is so hard uh people don't realize it because it always looks i mean i love i love watching comedy i love going to stand-up shows and i love watching comedy and i uh, and i love hearing comics talk about it you know and when you really get into that, those guys, it's so precise. It seems so loosey goosey and crazy, you know, but they, they work on that stuff nonstop. They work, they work, they work, they work, they work on bits and stuff to make it seem nonchalant, you know. Um, uh, that's why, and I love going to comedy uh, shows, especially with new guys that just do their 10 minutes, you know, because sometimes a guy will just get up there and just start riffing and it just hits and everyone's laughing. And then another guy gets up there and the whole audience is like, <laughs> and you're like, God, <laughs> you know, and it's just the night. And it's just the, uh, he just, he, it's like the audience is like a dog and it sniffs something that the guy's nervous or something. And it just doesn't work. You know, that doesn't mean he's a bad comic because any good comic has already had that experience, you know, where it didn't work that night. And they figure out how to beat that and get around it and get better at it, blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah. So going into an audition. Yeah. It was the worst. Luckily, from Breaking Bad, I didn't have to do auditions anymore. And it was just a, a phone call where they'd say, hey, would you like to do the show? You know? So. Oh, yeah. I love that. I mean, it's well-deserved. Yeah. That's a lot easier. <laughs> Taking it back to golf a little bit, what's what's a strong part of your game? What are you trying to work on right now? How are things? What's the current state of your game right now? Yeah, my, my, it's, you know, it's a little off. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I've added a few points to my handicap, and I, I intend to get rid of those in the next month or so. Uh, 
you never know, man. For a while, it was, my drive was, uh, I fixed my drive. For a while, I was, uh, I was fading it too much, which I guess they call that a slice. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. That's my problem, too. I have that same problem. Sounds a lot like a slice. <laughs> People say people nicely say fade when you slice one like crazy off the tee box, but you're like, yeah. well, that's a slice. I know it is. Yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, so I fixed that, uh, and my my iron game's been good. I've always, I've, I've, it's been a while since I've had a problem with my iron game. So if I, you know, make sure I keep it in the fairway on the first shot, then I feel pretty good. And then putting's always, you know, putting's putting. It's going to be good. It's going to be bad. Depends on, you know. I mean, you you take the you take the ones you you take five holes that you miss just like by that i mean you know what are you gonna do you know so yeah uh, you're, um, you're playing today do you like do you have swing like do you have round thoughts like pre-round thoughts are you going to a golf course today and being like all right i'm, I'm trying to accomplish something here today whether it's uh, like a, sometimes i'll have a mini goal just hit the fairway even if it means taking a seven iron off the tee or whatever right and if i, I feel to myself if i can implement that goal i play a better round do you have anything like that 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 you do i don't think i have a grand strategy i mean i i i try i come down to the each swing thought that i'm going to use that day you know and i and i try to uh i have a, a brother who's a, a great golfer and i asked him and so he'll give me three i go what are your three things you think of before you take the shot you know and uh, i'll try that for a while you know uh, like tempo, balance, and patience. That was a great one, you know. Yeah. Temp, tempo, balance, and patience. <laughs> it was, you know. Like that, so yeah. I just kind of do that mantra, and then and then hope that that translates into it, it before each swing. I find the hardest thing is, it, or the key thing, right? Is because we all know how to hit the ball. You can hit. We all know how to hit a great ball. The the thing is, and it's ridiculous. That's why we're talking golf because you can talk forever. But the key thing is getting to that point each and every stroke, right? Like if I, if, if you were to talk a grand strategy, one of my grand strategies, just don't duff a shot, mm -hmm. right? If you yeah. don't duff a shot, you're going to play, you're going to score great. You know, even if you don't hit, uh, you're not hitting career shots every time, you're just hitting the ball and not duffing it. You know, where you, I mean, there's nothing worse than a chip, right? Like I'll take a, like I hate a drive that goes out of bounds. But when you there and you chip and it go thank, I don't want to. I just want to rip my eyes out when I do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get you know, on the show you understands not, that. You, you're so among friends right now that you don't even. <laughs> like, it's like that's just the way it is for us. For preach, sure. brother, preach. Yeah, yeah man, dude. You know. It was uh like Hank Haney. I remember like I I bring this up a lot, but Hank Haney one time, and he tweets a good amount about it. But it's like at every level of golf everyone will score well if you can just eliminate three things and it's penalty shots yeah. multiple chips and yeah. three putting he's oh. like so that's it like oh. if you just that's don't it. do those three things you will just score well that is it that's exactly it man that's exactly it and nothing worse than decelerating into a fucking chip mm. when you just told yourself to not decelerate into the fucking chip but you're a little nervous because it's a little close and you do it and you're like, Gah! and you want to, you know, you just want to rip your head off, you know, dude, we just, we just played around recently and it's kind of like, uh, we, we have a video coming out, so I guess whatever, but I'll just talk about it. But I'm on a fucking hill or a little, a little slope coming out of a pond. And I'm like, all right, all right. We got lucky here that this ball didn't go in this water. It's a chip and a putt. <laughs> we're making a three. I'm standing there. I got my foot almost in the water. I feel kind of good. I got a nice look at it. I look yeah. down, I take my wedge, I go back, I get scared, I decel, I hit six inches behind the ball, the ball rolls two inches up, <laughs> goes right back down and into the water. It I try and go and get the ball. I'm like, I almost fall into the water. I'm on my stomach. My this this wedge shot ended with me on my back, physically on the ground, because I'm trying yeah. to get the ball. It's just uh, it's the worst feeling in the world. And, and uh, I think Trent has said this before, but it's amazing that like that little duff counts as much as like a 270 yard drive right down the middle, right? Yeah. Like that yeah. little, that little, little contact dink. is yeah. still a stroke. Right. Uh, oh, drives me crazy. Uh, that's the worst. Yeah. I'm with you, man. That's that, that's just the worst. Yeah, that's true. And it you know, obviously it doesn't show up on the scorecard, which how the shots happen, but they, uh, yeah. And that's, you're right. And three putting too. You got to make sure you, you get it in there, you know. Uh, 
Ah, okay. Now man, I'm gonna kick some ass today. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love that, man. Come on. You're so wild, man. Were, no deceleration today. No deceleration. <laughs> you just gotta commit. I mean, I'm not I'm not playing, so I can just tell you what to do. It's much easier than actually playing. You just gotta yeah. commit to the shot. That's it. You gotta commit to the shot, right? How, how many bad shots have we had trying to steer the ball, right? Yep. When you're like, or you're you just holding something back. It's never you gotta take the full club swing it fully and and uh and and you know let it and pray <laughs> and hope that it works out you know dude i can tell by like the second hole we're gonna get a message from dean <laughs> and be like fuck golf i hate i'm selling my claws <laughs> i'm done i'm never playing again i've never had that I, I had no friends who do i've never had that i i get because there's always you know there's always the proverbial one that gets you back you know that's the problem and yeah. you play that you know and you're so pissed off and then you just like Right. <laughs> yeah, because you. Uh, yeah, because you, then you do have the chip that you're standing over. You feel confident. And you hit the shot that you want to hit. Want to hit? Like, oh, that's why I'm out here. And then it does. Yeah. It brings it back. Exactly. So I've never, I've never thrown my clubs. Yet. Uh, uh, you have you? Yeah. Oh yeah. I have. I have my buddy to throw, do some throwing of clubs. But feels uh, good. I it's just like I just need it. I, usually, I would say. <laughs> 15 seconds later, I'm fine. But it's just in that moment, it's furious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I, oh, I get where it comes from. Don't get me wrong. I just, I haven't done that. Uh, and I haven't, like, sworn off golf. Like, fuck it, I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Dean Norris, he's, uh, you got the new show, the United States of Al on CBS. Check it out. And if you haven't, if somehow you haven't seen Breaking Bad, it is again in my opinion the best show i've ever seen and you're obviously a huge uh part of the reason why so we're big fans and, and go thanks, man. It. today's your day all right man today's my day all right guys all right thanks thank a you lot. Dean. talk to you later guys thanks, all right. later, man. thanks have a good one